I'm just talking. <laughs> uh, so welcome back to the Ansible Track for the second day. I'm very glad to see the full room again. Uh, we've got a pretty busy schedule. I think there's one 15 minute break, but other than that, a lot of good talks coming up. I'm going to kick off with David. Again? No, we love you. That's why you're here. <laughs> He's going to go in a bit deeper with Aaron, and then I'm going to get out of shot and let you listen to him. Thank you very much. So we have um, a little difficulty for people following at home. Um, we don't have the computer screen yet just yet. We have the camera. Um, you know, the expert is working on it. Hopefully it will recover sometime, or uh, pretty soon. We'll get started. Um, uh, show of hands, how many were you uh, in my uh, yesterday's session? Wow, lots of hands, that's great. So um, this goes a little bit deeper into um, you know, ARA, what, what it is, what it does, how it works. Um, and so um, under the hood, how ARA records Ansible playbooks that makes them easier to understand and show you. Uh, who am I? Well, for those who were not here yesterday, I am David Morosamard, um, known as DM Samard on, on Matrix, IRC, and elsewhere. Um, I am also on Fossilon. Um, I fly from Montreal in Canada. Um, you may find me in many, one of many rabbit holes, that's where I, I, I lay. Uh, I have a background of about 15 years of experience, assistant men, uh, DevOps, Siri, uh, this kind of thing. Um, I've been an Invisible user since version 1.8 or so, uh, back in 2014. Um, I learned much, much later that Michael DeHaan actually came to present Ansible at PyCon Montreal, but I, did, I didn't go, so I didn't get to meet him, unfortunately. Um, I created Ara back in 2016 to make my life easier. Um, I was previously in the Ansible community team at Red Hat. Not anymore, but I love you guys. Keep doing what you're doing. Um, I'm a, nowadays, I'm a part-time open source contrib contributor. I do it because I like it, um, between some of my work as a DevOps and as a dad. Um, so if you're here, you probably already know about Ansible, um, radically um, a simple IT automation system. I use it for a wide range of things. You might, you, if you listened to my talk yesterday, you know. Um, so Ansible is not just about configuration management. You can do whatever you want with it, really. Um, I use it as a great abstraction layer to glue different tools and processes together. Um, what you might want to use Ansible for, typical configuration management. Um, here we uh, install Nginx, we configure a VOs for a website, um, and then we make sure that Nginx is started. If we change the VHost, Ansible will, will start it automatically. It's a handler, configuration management, it's great, it works. So if I run this playbook, what does it look like? You might have seen this before, uh, typical console output when you run Ansible playbook. Um, and then if I run this playbook again, nothing changes because of item potency, right? So, you know, I've already installed Nginx, I've already configured a website, um, I run it again, and you know, nothing changes because, well, there's nothing to change. So there you go. Um, if I want to have more verbosity, because, you know, uh, there's, not, there's not much going on in here. Um, you can tell that it's not doing much, but you don't really have details about what it's doing. Um, if you add some verbosity in there, um, let's, let's, you can go as many as four Vs, I think. <laughs> it gets really, really noisy when you add three Vs. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not showing this today for the sake of <laughs> brevity. Um, and you can also uh, add dash dash diff, so you can have context when it's changing a file. So we see, we see it here, you know, it's adding a new vhost, and we can see, you know, what's adding or removing, and so on. So this is great. Uh, what you're not seeing here, though, is that it's scrolling way... <laughs> like, look at the size of the scroll bar, right? Because it's very ver verbose. Um, it's in... Whoops, sorry about that. Um, it's in JSON. Um, and what you, would, yeah, what you would see in your in your console might actually look like something like this, right? Because, well, it's not HTML, it doesn't scroll. You know, your console is fixed width. So, um, you're a human, and you need to find out what's happening. This is what you end up with. Uh, it's not. It's not exactly great. Um, so this was me uh, back in 2016 uh, because, well, I was triple tuning playbooks uh, every day as part of my job at Red Hat. I was in the OpenStack organization. Um, they use a lot of OpenStack for many things. Um, one of which was running integration tests, deploying OpenStack, configuring it, and so on. Um, so the the reality is, CI it fails uh, because, well, that's what CI does. If it doesn't fail, 
uh, maybe you should worry about that. <laughs> so um, FCI is already screened, that's cool, but eh, uh, it will fail. So you need to spend time understanding and troubleshooting why exactly it failed, right? So then you need to go back to this output in Jenkins, you know, GitLab CI, whatever, to try and figure out, um, you know, what happened. Um, and if your browser doesn't crash because, you know, there's so much output to load. Um, so this output uh, comes from something that's called um, a callback plugin. So in Ansible, there's a default one. That's, one, that's the one that you know, you're expected to use uh, when you're using Ansible out of the box. Um, oh, something I forgot to mention. Throughout this presentation, there's some links in there. Um, so when I share the slides, you can go uh, and you know, um, learn more and dig through um, some of these components. Um, so yes, um, so this comes from the default Ansible callback. Um, it, you can tweak it to some extent, uh, you know, add robustity, remove robustity. Um, I believe there's a, even a new YAML uh, output now. So instead of having a lot of JSON, you can have a lot of YAML. <laughs> I guess, you know, <laughs> that's easier. Um, if you like YAML, I guess. Um, so there's different kinds of callbacks. Um, the default one is what's called an STD out callback. So this is really what controls um, what the console output looks like. Uh, you can only have one at any given time, uh, but you can have um, different callbacks that add to the output of this callback. So you can have um, one that I really like that's built, is it built in? I, I forget. Um, there's one called profile tasks. So what it will do, I see nodding in the room, so I think, yeah, it's still built in. I forget sometimes, you know, which split after the collection uh, in two time. Um, so profile, huh? And, oh, it's in Ansible POSIX, so it's no longer built in. Well, it, uh, all right, okay, I was close. I was close. I was close. It's, it's built, built in into the Ansible community package, though, yeah. right? Because POSIX is in there, right? Um, so different kinds of callbacks. The profile tasks uh, callback, what it does, I don't, I don't have an example here, but um, what it does is um, for every task, it will tell you how long the task took and the date as well. So if you're sending that to your logs or something, you know, it can help to some extent. Uh, but then instead of 10,000 lines, you have 20,000 lines to go through. So whatever, it works. Um, there's different kind of callbacks. Um, the type of the R callback is awesome um, because, I don't know, it works. <laughs> I, put there one, I put that there one day, I didn't break anything. Um, so that's it there. Um, it's, a, it's an awesome callback um, and it works. Um, I put a link here. Um, I'll leave the slide up for a second if you want to take a picture or something. Um, this is uh, something that was contributed by uh, someone in the Ansible community on Reddit. Um, so he went through uh, all of the callbacks in um, um, a certain version of Ansible. It hasn't been updated in a bit. But there's um, Ask Kinema videos of every callback. So you can see you have a kind of a preview of what the different callback plugins look like. So it's pretty cool. I thought I would share that. Because there's a lot of callback plugins that do a variety of things. So how do Ansible callback plugins work? So um, Ansible provided hooks so you can run arbitrary Python code basically based on any event. So this could mean um, you know, there's a Slack callback that fires events to Slack, but it's really Python code that you know, is meant to send data to Slack. There's some that send data to Elasticsearch, um, there's, there's some that write HTML. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there, there's, there's a variety of hooks here. Um, and so you, so you can write your own callback plugins. And if something happens, you can, you know, use your imagination and uh, be creative. And then you know, write the code and Ansible will run it. Um, so this is what Ara uses to um, report results. Um, at first, there was no API. Now there's one. Uh, we'll get to that in a bit. So really, within, um, so ara0.x used to run a Flask backend um, that would record data to an SQLite database. Um, it worked, you know, uh, for a long time. Um, uh, and it looked like this, you know. So the callback talked directly, basically, to the, to the database. Uh, not great, but hey, it worked. Um, so, so it worked, worked but uh, it was built on the foundation of a weekend proof of concept. So I had the idea for Ara on like a Friday, I neglected my family for the weekend, 
Uh, and then I, I had like a working proof of concept on the following Monday. Um, it was not very flexible because it required the callback to have access to the database. Um, this, you know, there's no authentication layer or anything. It meant that the callback needed to talk directly to the database. It was not great. Um, because there was no API, um, I needed, uh, you needed knowledge of the database model, uh, knowing what filters to apply, what table or what joins to do. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't exactly great. Um, what this means is that there were duplicated code across the different tooling within ARA. So ARA had a CLI interface, but then you, you still had these direct database calls uh, within the CLI. Not great. Um, I tried to add an API on top of the existing class backend using class restful. Um, I got pretty far with it, but it, um, I ran into a variety of issues. Um, some performance, some related to how class restful works. Um, so uh, I tried really hard to make it work, it, uh, but I couldn't make it. Um, and then someone convinced me uh, to try and uh, rewrite everything to Django and Django REST framework. So I, I'm not a you know a software uh, well you know I've had software engineer titles, but I am not a programmer by trade. Uh, I, I do not code you know 40 hours a week. Um, but I write code to uh, help me in my work, you know, as a system man, it's very useful to learn. Um, Django was relatively new to me at the time, and I was very lucky and privileged to have people uh, contributing to the project, um, one of which was Django Core, uh, really helped me, you know, bootstrap the entire thing. Um, and what I, I learned over time is that Django REST framework um, provides a bunch of stuff out of the box for free. Um, and it made it really easy, in fact. Once we had the database model figured out in Django, the rest mostly came, you know, fairly naturally. Um, so now there's an API. Um, you can see what it looks like. There's a demo link here. Um, so you can browse. Uh, this is something that Django REST framework does for free. It's not me that, you know, I, I did it. Um, it, it. It comes out of the box. So you can browse the API, you know, walk through the different endpoints, see what the fields for the different um, objects are, and then you can do queries all as well, you know, through um, get parameters. So there, there's, an IP, there's an API, that's great. This means that the callback can use it. So instead of, you know, the callback talking directly to the database, it can talk to an API, and the API takes care of, you know, all, all the rest of, you know, wrapping around uh, the database drivers, uh, authentication, and things like that. So again, something that comes for free with Django. Um, um, this means that the CLI can also use the API. So we have an API, let's use it. We get a client. Um, there's, a, there's a library in, uh, that is built into Aura that's, that makes it easier to get a client. So it's, it's Python requests, it's nothing very complicated. Um, it's very simple, in fact. So there's a couple of, of, of arguments here that's provided by the CLI. Um, the, uh, we, we go through a couple of arguments to filter our request. Let's say we're searching for um, a particular playbook name, for example. Um, this is where it would go. Uh, and then, you know, we, we send that over to the playbooks endpoint. We, we, we take those query arguments, we send that to the API, we get a result. Uh, it's magic, it works, that's great. Um, and then, once we have an API, well, in fact, we can do whatever we want, because, well, uh, why not create Ansible plugins that talk to the R API, why not? So here we have um, an action plugin. So action plugins in Ansible um, allow you to do a variety, variety of things um, the difference with typical modules is that they run directly on the controller machine. So pretend you have an action plugin. Um, one might be um, the debug module, I guess, would be an action plugin. So you, uh, in, even though you're running against the remote host, the plugin will run locally. You won't run, you know, on the remote host. So here we have a, a fairly simple playbook. We we retrieve. <laughs> So as we're running a playbook, it's being recorded in real time by Ara, uh, but we want to recover the ID of the playbook that's running so we can do things with it. So there's an action plugin for that. We retrieve the, the playbook ID. 
Uh, and then there's a lookup plugin, our API, which allows freeform you know, queries to the API. Um, so this allows us to recover the base URL for the ARA um, web interface. And then, you know, at the end of a playbook, we could print a friendly link so that someone could, you know, go look at the playbook report for this particular playbook. Um, oh, this might be a little bit on the small side. Uh, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. Oh, yeah, that's better. Uh, so, you know, I do a lot of things with Ansible, um, including integration testing uh, Ansible itself. So I use Ansible to run integration tests against Ara. So whenever I send a PR, you know, I can tell that there's no regressions because I'm really testing the behavior of Ansible as it's recording the playbook. So here, kind of the same thing, you know, I recover the playbook. Um, I, um, I uh, query the Ara API to get some data about the playbook, the task, the results, the hosts. And then I validate that you know it works properly. The the playbook as it's saved currently in Ara is basically what I expect it to. So that you know if sometimes if if someone breaks something, well then you know this 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 playbook will help us find out what's the issue. Uh, let me zoom a little bit back out. Um, this is another example, and I don't suggest that you, you necessarily do that. Someone asked me. Um, could Ara send um, you know, uh, data about playbooks to Slack because they use Slack? I have nothing against Slack, uh, and um, I didn't want Ara to be in the business of sending messages to Slack. However, there is a Slack module in Ansible. So we can, uh, you know, it's fairly similar to how we did it before. We can, we can ask Ara, return me the playbooks that started after a certain timestamp. Um, and then we could, you know, filter these down. Maybe you want to return just the failed playbooks, for example, or maybe you want to return just the playbooks that are currently running. So, you know, it's an API. <laughs> it's flexible. You can do whatever you want. Um, and then uh, we send a Slack notification uh, using the, you know, Ansible Slack module with uh, some sort, some form of, sorry, some sort of friendly message, you know, formatted um, this playbook on this host, ran this task on, so on. So it's an API. You can do whatever you want. Um, we can do this because there's built-in API clients. So when you install Ara, regardless if you have the server or not, uh, it comes built in. Um, there is an HTTP client, so you can query a remote Ara server. Um, here, there's the the demo uh, the demo instance, um, and then you know th that's basically how it works. You you import the library, you instantiate the client. And then you're already you're ready to do queries and you know um, do stuff with them. Um, Ara by default is offline, so kind of <laughs> I'll get into that later. Um, but what this means is I can install Ansible and Ara on my laptop. I don't need to run a server somewhere. Ara takes care of spinning up a server in the background, so I don't need to. So you don't need to set up a container. You don't need to set up a service. Um, it's offline. Um, it's offline because it used to be really offline. <laughs> we had, so in Flask, there was this library that allowed you to query, um, uh, query uh, without needing to stand up a Flask uh, server. In Django, there wasn't something like that. Um, in Django, though, what I, what I uh, did at first um, was uh, there is a unit test, uh, um, there's a unit test um, HTTP client in Django. So when you're running like unit, Django unit tests, you can like query your API, but it, you know, it, it doesn't need to spin up a server because it's, you know, it's for unit tests. Um, so I did it that way at first until, you know, this Django core person told me you should probably not do that. You know, it's not meant to do, to do this. So what we ended up doing is, um, it's transparent to the user. You don't need to do anything about it when you run a playbook. Um, it will spin up an ephemeral server just for the duration of the playbook. Once the playbook ends, the server spins down, and that's it. Um, so it's cool because you know it. it in the, for the sake of simplicity, you know you don't need to start a server and then you connect the clients to it. Uh, you don't need to spin up you know an instance or anything. You know it's just there and you can run it whatever, wherever you want. So, what does it look like at a high level? 
So, wherever you run Ansible, and however you run it, it can be Ansible pull, it can be AWX, it can be AAP, it can be Jenkins, it can be GitLab CI, it doesn't really matter where you run Ansible, because, well, it's just a callback plugin. So wherever you can enable a callback plugin, it just works. So something runs an Ansible playbook, and then it goes through the callback hooks, um, and then for each event, our, the ARA callback sends the data to the server, the server serializes the, the data as it needs to be. Um, it saves it to a database. So it can be SQLite, uh, which is the default. You can also use MySQL or Postgre. And then, you know, it, it kind of returns like this. So this is a, a blocking operation, unfortunately. So what this means is there could be a, a sleep 9000 uh, inside the callback, and Ansible will just wait, right? So. Um, in, in the callback, we actually background as many things as we can. And it's actually amazing that it actually works. So there's a, there's a thread pool inside the callback plugin. Um, and there's, uh, I should have included that in, in the presentation, I forget. If you're interested in how this works, I'll show you afterwards. Um, but basically, we, we background the things that are non-blocking, um, such that the playbook can continue while in the background, it's still sending data to um, the ARA server. Um, so, you know, uh, what's ARA? Well, it's another recursive acronym. Uh, it features simplicity as a core principle. Um, if you want to check it out, there's the Git repo there. Um, it records playbooks. Um, it records hosts, tasks, results, files. Um, you can record, um, I, had, I had a question earlier um, what was it? Oh, can, can ARA record the version of a collection that was run? Well, it doesn't out of the box, but there is a, there's a, a plugin. Uh, you know, earlier we were talking about the, the, um, the action plugins. So there is an ARA record plugin that allows you to record whatever you want. So as long as you can recover the version of your collection somehow, you can use this action plugin to tie, in, to tie that into your playbook report. So um, it records uh, what you want. Um, what it looks like to get started. So you install ARA wherever Ansible is. Um, this can be, you know, if you're running uh, Ansible from a container image or uh, an execution environment, ARA would need to be installed inside. So it, as long as uh, ARA is installed right next to Ansible, it's going to work. Um, then you configure, the, uh, you configure Ansible to use the ARA callback plugin. Um, I, I will come back, I will circle back to this in a moment. Um, and then that's it. You don't need to change your workflows. You run your Ansible playbooks as usual. Um, and then it's recorded. Uh, that's it. Um, by default, you can, it can be on your laptop. It doesn't matter. Um, you don't need, uh, the, the CLI will use the offline uh, clients by default. So you don't need to spin up a server. You can just type in the CLI commands it will spin up uh, an informal server just for the duration of this one re request, and you'll spin it back down. If you do want to spin up um, a server, you can do it uh, with the built-in um, development server. So ARA manage run server, it'll, it'll make a server uh, available for you. Just a moment. Um, so what if you do want the server? Because maybe you want to aggregate data from multiple different locations. Maybe you're running playbooks in the different places. So you can spin up a server and then send data to it, for example. So here, here um, it, it, we use um, the container images that are published by the project. We create um, a directory for um, the database, the SQLite database, and the settings file to live in. And then I don't judge whether you prefer Podman or Docker. <laughs> it works all the same. Um, and whether you prefer Docker Hub or Cradle.io, the images are published to both. So this gives you uh, an API server uh, and a web reporting interface that you can use. Um, but you need to send data to it. Otherwise, you know, it, it's empty, right? So then to send data to it, it's the same thing. You install ARA. But you don't need the, the server dependencies because, well, there's already a server running somewhere. You tell Ansible, you know, load the Ansible uh, DRR callback plugin. 
And then this is where you tell Aura to um, the Aura callback to use the HTTP client, and then where the data should go. And then you know you run your playbook as usual. <coughs> you can use the CLI, and you don't need to spin up a you know a server because well it's already running and everything is recorded in real time. So as the playbook runs, you can go in, in the web interface because there's already a server running. Um, so what about the developer side? Um, so this is kind of the, uh, the, the, the live demo that I have for you right now. Uh, let me go uh, in my shell here. Uh, oh, uh, I have, you know, yesterday I did not have a, a, a bright profile and now I have one. There you go. Solarized light. I'm not, I'm not a fan, but hey, it works better on the projector. Um, so I'm in, uh, I've cloned the RI Git repo, just like I would if I, I would like to send a patch. You know, you fork the repo, you clone it. Um, a, so as, um, as, uh, as someone who would like to contribute a patch, if I want to test it first, uh, we use talks for uh, running tests. So um, the, the, there's a few comments here uh, in the slides. Um, this example here, it spins up. Um, so Tox, for, for those who don't know, um, it manages virtual environments for testing. For, um, so it takes care of creating a virtual environment and then running whatever, whatever testing commands you provide it to. So in civil integration, in fact, what it does is it installs Aura, it installs Ansible, and then it runs um, Ansible with a, a series of playbooks with the Aura plugin enabled. So, you know, uh, it, it, it will test that the integration between Ansible and Aura works. Um, so, let me go back to my shell here. So, I already have the Tox environment ready. You know, it's kind of like a cooking show. I already have a cake ready. Um, so, I use Fish, but, you know, some people use Bash. Uh, I use Fish, so there you go. Um, so now I have, um, Aura, I have Aura installed in the virtual environment by way of Tox. Um, and then the command that I, I showed you earlier, um, uh, Aura set up callback plugins, really all, all it does is it prints the location of the callback plugin um, because the callback plugin can be um, in various locations depending on how you've installed Aura depending on the Linux distro. Maybe you've installed it inside a virtual environment. Uh, maybe you've installed it uh, system-wide. Maybe you've installed it um, with pip install uh, dash dash user, so it's in your own environment. So Aura knows where it is. So it, it returns this path, which makes it easy to enable um, you know, the callback plugin. Um, a question I had yesterday was, um, can I put this in an Ansible CFG file? Well, sure, you, you, not the, the Python command, but this path, you could put it in an Ansible CFG file and it will work. But the thing is, as soon as this path changes, well then it no longer works. So if you're sharing you know, uh, roles and playbooks and config with colleagues uh, or your team and you have different setups, it's not gonna work, right? So this is why it's, uh, the, the helper exists, it's convenient. You can put that in your bash RC, uh, your profile file, and then you know, it will just work. So let me enable Aura here. Um, I export the uh, variable. Um, and then uh, I can run, uh, I have, uh, so this is the, the Ansible Git repo, uh, the Aura Git repo. I have some integration tests here. Um, and then uh, we can run, uh, let me, so I will also uh, enable uh, action plugins and lookup plugins uh, because the tests that I will run will actually use those. So let's do that. And so we'll look at plugins. There you go. So these uh, these are work the same. They just provide the path to the plugins. So there's that. Um, and then let's run uh, the lookup tests. So it's going to run the plugin. Uh, it's going to run the playbook. Um, there's some red stuff, but it's expected. Um, you're familiar with this playbook, uh, with this kind of output. Uh, and then we have this example from the documentation that I showed you earlier. But because it was running with the default offline client, you can see here there's local host and then this random TCP port. Well, it's because this, it's this ephemeral server. So the link <laughs> does not really work if I use it. However, what I can do, 
um, without doing, uh, you know, needing to do anything else, I can fire up the server here. Um, it, it's it's ready to go. I can go uh, like this, and then I have well, I have a, a bunch of playbooks because well, I have this long database that I, because I, I use it all the time. Um, so I have this playbook here that I just ran. Uh, everything went fine. It took seven seconds to run. Um, it's there, um, and then you know I can tell that everything went all right. Um, I can look at this failure here. Uh, generate a failure that will be rescued. Okay, so it was in the block rescue, so it, it it's still a failure from Ara's perspective, even though it didn't fail the playbook, because Ara cannot tell um, whether a, a failure was rescued because it happens later. Um, the callback interface is synchronous. So, it, you know, if something happens later, uh, you know, it's hard to go back to find out um, how it actually happened. So I have the failure here. Let me switch to the bright mode. That may be better for you. Um, so I have the details from the, this failure here. I can click on this path, and it, it shows me, you know, exactly um, the task that fell inside the block. So I can see here it's a block. There's a rescue. Okay, it turns out it's not actually an issue, um, so we can go on. <laughs> it was a test failure for test. Uh, it was a failure for test purposes, you know, with a thumbs up. So that's great. Um, now, um, because everything is here on my laptop, I don't need a remote environment or anything. If I want to send a patch, I can edit the HTML templates. I can add features inside the callback. I can. Um, do, I can uh, adjust the API, um, do database model changes, um, and then I can test this locally right out of my laptop. I don't need anything else. So I think that's great. Um, it's, you know, it, is, it is simple, uh, at least to me, um, and so I hope that uh, you can try that. Um, then uh, I can show you perhaps what the... Uh, what, oh, no. <laughs> I don't have... It's too... CLIs are hard, right? So this is, uh, it's not too bad. All right, so this is what the CLI looks like. Um, it has, it kind of has parity with the web reporting interface. So, you know, the things that you find in the web interface, you will find in the CLI. You can also filter by the various fields. Um, however, there is, there is one set of features that exists in the CLI that does not in the web interface. So if I do our help here, um, and then grab for matrix. Oops. So there's some um, there's some metrics here that are available: uh, host matrix, playbook matrix, uh, and task matrix. So maybe you want to know, um, you know, on average, how much time playbooks take. This would be you know playbook matrix. So I can do our playbook matrix, and then I can aggregate. Um, by different things. So hang on. So here I have an aggregate by, so it aggregates the metrics by by the aggregate. In this case, it's the file. So you yeah. increase the text size again. Yes, sure. <laughs> um, so I have an aggregate by file here. Uh, it tells me, oh, okay, so I've ran this, this particular playbook eight times. It took this time in total, this time in average. And these were the, the results for each, for, you know, as a total for each of those playbooks. I, we have something similar for hosts. Um, and then I can aggregate by other things, right? So let me show you real quick. Um, so we can aggregate by, uh, by, um, by path, which is, which is what we had. We can aggregate by name. So if you give your playbook's name, you can aggregate by that by Ansible version, by controller. So Ansible version and controllers can be interesting because um, I, I, could, I could try it here. Um, aggregate uh, Ansible version. So um, pretend you know you have uh, different versions of Ansible going, or maybe you, know, you update your versions of Ansible over time. Um, it could cause regressions, or it could, be, uh, it could actually improve the performance, right? So here you have the different versions of Ansible. Uh, it's grouped by version of Ansible and then uh, or Ansible Core in this case, um, and then you know you have the data here. Um, same thing for hosts, um, host metrics. 
So I have these hosts here, and I can tell what were the results for each host. And then I could, I could filter down, well, only return me matrix for hosts that had a failure or were unreachable, for example. Uh, and then the same thing for matrix, uh, or, or tasks, in, uh, in fact. So here I have, uh, by default, it will uh, aggregate by action. So I can find out, you know, oh, uh, our playbooks are actually pretty quick. Um, commands, not so much. But then I can, you know, this, this is how you might troubleshoot uh, performance uh, or improve the performance of your playbooks. So this is something that is only available in the CLI, not in the web interface, because, well, I'm not much of a front-end person. So if you're good at, you know, graphs and fancy things, uh, reach out and, you know, we can do something pretty. Um, so that's, that's that for the demo. Uh, oh, wrong window. Um, so let me go back here. Um, so um, Ara could use your help. Um, I'm just one person doing this, you know, part time because I like it. Um, I am not the most skilled engineer, um, and um, I rely on contributors to help out. So um, there's a couple of projects here. There's Ara that you know about. Um, did I skip a slide? Yes, I did. So <laughs> there's an Ansible collection too for uh, Ara. So the collection is not to install Aura and configure the callback plugin, or at least not yet. It's about standing up an Aura API server. So the demo website that you've seen, demo.recordsensible.org, um, is actually deployed using this collection. Um, so uh, we, uh, there's a playbook in the, um, uh, in the Aura infra repo. So it provisions the live demo. Um, long story short, it deploys MySQL using uh, Gearling Guy's role. Thank you, Gearling Guy. Um, and then it uses the Ara collection to deploy the Ara API server. Um, so it's Django, uh, and it uses uh, G-Unicorn to run it. And then it sets up uh, an Nginx proxy in front that handles um, you know, the reverse proxy things and the uh, SSL termination. So this is there. It works. It's great. Um, could use your help. And then Ara Infra, which is where um, uh, where we uh, stand up the, the demo website and the website itself where the blog uh, is. If you want to find out how you can contribute, there's a link here. Um, I, I hope you could tell that it was pretty simple to get started. So I'm looking forward to, to, your, uh, to your PRs. Um, there's other, some other interesting approach, uh, approach, uh, approaches. <laughs> Sorry, getting a little bit tired here, running out of steam. Um, uh, that are somewhat similar to Aura in terms of approach. So I, I figured I would mention them. So Aura uh, Ansible JSON Monitor, what it does, it uses the JSON plugin in Ansible, uh, the JSON uh, callback plugin in Ansible um, to output everything from the playbook into a JSON file. And then this project, it provides um, a binary to read this JSON file. So it's kind of like how Aura saves thing into a database, and then you know because it's in the database, you, we can do a lot, a lot of things with it. Well, this is using a JSON file instead of database, so you know it's a little bit limited, but you know it's interesting nonetheless. So uh, feel free to check it out. Um, this one, Caradoc, uh, is inspired by Aura, so instead of saving things to a database, um, it saves things to uh, ASCII doc files. So you can have like HTML reports based on ASCII docs. Um, you know, it works, so you can try that. Um, and then there's Ansible CMDB. Um, so you can see like host facts um, and things like that. Um, you know, limited amount of reporting. So feel free to check it out. Um, if you want to know more, there will be the Ansible Contributor Summit in this very room tomorrow. I will be here with other fine humans from the Ansible community. Um, and uh, otherwise, there was a talk uh, last year at FOSDEM, uh, simple but uh, useful Ansible reporting with Ara. Uh, it was virtual, unfortunately, so it's recorded. It's available. Um, you can check it out. Um, amongst other things, I have a live demo in this talk that's kind of um, that's pretty interesting. So I stand up an AWX uh, instance uh, using uh, Kubernetes, and then I hook up AWX to send its results to an Ara server. 
so that you can have like kind of the best of both worlds. You have AWX to manage your playbooks, like you might have already, or using Tower or you know AAP controller, um, and then Ara for granular uh, metrics and reporting. Um, this is what I had for you today. Um, um, come chat or stay up to date. There's a blog in here where I, I, I highlight some of the cool things when there's a new release, or I, I post benchmarks or things like that. Um, there's a community page here with a bunch of links. Um, so we have a channel on Libera Chat. It's Bridge to Matrix. Um, I used to be active on Twitter back before you know was bought by some billionaire, um, and then uh, now it's now on Fossidon. So um, if you if you're a Mastodon, you can follow the account for updates. Um, I post some tips and tricks sometimes as well. Um, you can reach out to me directly. You know where to find me, um, and I'll open it up for questions. Any questions? Yes. How much would you say does network latency uh, impact the activity execution between a Ansible controller and a power server? Yes. So an excellent question. The question is. Um, uh, uh, how much latency? Uh, uh, how much of a problem is latency between the different components involved, right? Um, so let me go back a couple of slides here. Um, so an excellent question because latency is important. What I tell people is that um, I, in an ideal situation, everything should be local. That's like because you'll have the least possible overhead. So for example, you might have a Bastion host, which runs your Ansible playbooks. Um, and then on this Bastion host that runs Ansible playbooks, you have Ara. And then you might have a MySQL server that's also local. Why you might want to have MySQL? Um, you could run into concurrency issues if running multiple playbooks at the same time, uh, backed by SQLite. Um, if you're running Ansible from your playbook, going through a Bastion host, uh, and then you know it needs to come back every time, and then your Ara server is elsewhere, and then the database server is halfway across the world. You know it's going to be a big overhead. So even you know 10, 10, 20 milliseconds, it adds up over the course of a playbook, and it's kind of um, I want to say exponential, but I'm not sure of my math here. But pretend you have a hundred tasks, and then you have ten hosts. It's not so bad, right? But if you have a hundred tasks and then a hundred hosts. You know, there's a couple of 10, if you have 10 milliseconds for every task on every host, it really adds up quickly. So um, my best advice, you keep the things as close as possible. And in general, whether you use Aura or not, what I do recommend is to run Ansible playbooks directly from the Bastion hosts, because there's a definite performance penalty going, jumping through hosts and back. Does that answer the question? Thank you. Any other questions? Yes? Is there some kind of uh, access control mechanism if you want to host uh, RS server somewhere public? Yes, excellent question. So the question is, is there a way to protect the, the, the web interface because, well, there's some sensitive information in there, right? Because RS picks up everything that's, that Ansible sends it. So if you have secrets or passwords or tokens that gets printed to your SS, to your you know your your console output, they'll be picked up by Ara, and you don't want to leak that out to you know the public internet. So um, there's uh, let me zoom out a little bit. Uh, so there's uh, two ways to do that. Uh, the first there's um, there's a way uh, to uh, use Django for authentication. So Django has, you know, it has a lot of things out of the box. And one one thing it does is it allows authentication. Um, so there are settings. If you look through the documentation, it's like Ara. Uh, oh, I have a blank here, but um, it's in the docs. Basically, what it does is you need to create a user in Django, um, and then you know it will. If you try to access the web interface, then it will show you, you know, um, please authenticate, you know, and then you can authenticate and it'll work. And then the callback needs to use these, um, this username and password that you've specified, right? Um, this works, however, there is a performance penalty when you do that because for every request that you do, there needs to be a, a database lookup. Like Django will check 
who is this user? Is, it the, is, the, is the authentication uh, valid? And so when you have 100 tasks across 100 hosts, you know, again, it adds up, right? Um, what is probably the best way is that you put whatever proxy you want in front, Nginx, Apache. Um, it can be, you know, LDAP authentication. It can be whatever you want. Um, uh, DRI collection out of the box supports setting up authentication with Nginx um, and an HD password file. So you put your users in there, and then it's Nginx who's handling the authentication, and that's like super fast. There's no database lookup. Nginx handles that like out of memory, um, and it works great. So um, I do not recommend leaving your ARA instance unprotected out on the internet um, because, well, um, you could leak uh, something. Yes, definitely. Great question. Thank you. Do we have any questions on, online, perhaps? No, nothing so far. No? All right. Yeah. Anyone else in the room? We got... One last one? Yeah, we got time for one more question. Question? One quick one? No. All right. All right. Thank so, you much, yeah. Um, before I let you clap, I have these very limited amount of R stickers. <laughs> if you have one of the stickers, it's because you've met me here or elsewhere. I'll leave them on the table there. Uh, if you cannot get one, those are the last ones I have. So you know, don't don't go, don't be dangerous or rush or anything. Uh, but uh, thank you very much, and I was happy to present for you.